voices. Um, so you can see that everyone consents to the recording. It's just popped up on my screen. Um, and we share, we do want to share the recording only because we haven't yet shared recordings, but I've been having to then kind of summarize what's been said and sent it to Welsh government. But I feel like we should sh share what the, the actual recording of the cafe with everyone if we can, um, because it's, it's just very powerful. I've listened back to all of the cafes so far and it's very powerful. Anyway, we'll, we'll see, um, but I know, Maimuna, you want to just review it and decide whether you want your bit shared, and that's absolutely fine. There is no pressure, okay? Um, so I will introduce you all at the beginning, and I will just lead the conversation. So unless I say, you know, this, I'll make clear who the questions are for and who I'm coming to. I think you know all this anyway, because I've talked to you all about it. Um, and, and the idea is to have quite a dynamic, fast-moving conversation rather than do long speeches, um, because I just feel there's so many questions we need to answer. I've got a few, and then we'll see. Lots will come in on the chat. But obviously, if you want to make a point, um, if you want to make a point about any of the questions that other people have been asked, you can just, um, you know, make yourself known. As a speaker obviously you say I'd like to come in on that you know it's, I'm not going to stop anyone speaking obviously um yeah I think we're going to have a great conversation we've got 70 people signed up which is fab we've got 80 people signed up actually 80 now fab let's hope yeah. all the last I just hope that all the last ones that register get the link do they get the link Sarah the last ones that register that's what I always worry about um well anyway i was they get it automatically i think hopefully when they register register what's a register if it's what's the link to my heart he's going to try and log on let me just see the name of it bame covid19 support group for wales bame covid 19 support group. How are you doing, Mamuna? Nice to see you. I'm good, how are you? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. You? <laughs> we'll start just crossing over in loads of meetings now. <laughs> how was <laughs> cafe the other day i didn't realize it was on the actual day that we had the meeting so i just oh. carried on with work i saw your email i was like oh yeah and then when i looked at it i was like oh it's already started it was today yeah no sorry i should have made that clear but no, it was good it was really interesting actually it was really yeah. good nice. yeah um uzo are you still there uzo i just wanted to ask um are you the only BME special advisor in Welsh Government? Yes, I am. I'm the only BME specialist advisor. Yes. My so God. specialist policy, uh, specialist um, advisor rather than special advisor. Special advisors are political, but specialist policy advisors are not. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the latter. I'm just keeping an eye on the waiting room, but um, Shivana isn't there yet. Do you want me to drop her a message? Sorry, I'm just shifting shifting something. Don't worry. Um, yeah, I know she's... I've, I've messaged her this morning on WhatsApp. I know she's... Um, well, yeah, maybe do drop her a message. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just checking my notes a minute. How often do you do the privileged cafes, Mamina? Um, every week. Yeah. Every week. Yeah, hopefully going to be um, 
opened up some new rooms in the cafe soon, so we're gonna have different topics in different rooms and stuff. So, yeah, oh, every nice. week. Also on Thursday is the next one. Uh, yeah, next week. My mum, I think I've missed your meeting. I'm so sorry. You have. <laughs> You're busy. I'm so sorry. I, it's I okay. I got so confused because I was in over 15 meetings not very dead yeah. that we were chatting i'll try and come to the next one you know to support okay. you and okay. and learn as well you know sorry about that that's okay i know you're busy it's fine so Uza, when I, when we start i'm going to come to you first with we're all deeply worried about the high number of bane people and specifically yes. women who are losing their lives can you yeah. share some reflections on why you think this may be happening sure okay what order are we going in? Are we going in order on the email? I think I will go stick to that order because I think that will work quite well if you go third, my Muna. I'll go first. Third. Third, sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> go first, go first. <laughs> I'm kind of used to it now with the Privilege Cafe. I would have been really nervous by now, but yeah, I'm okay actually. Good. Oh, Sarah's moved. I like your background there, Sarah. Can't hear. Oh, you're muted. I don't show you the rest of the room. No, don't worry. Uzo, also, when you have to, are you still thinking you might have to go after half an hour, Uzo? No, I'll be able to stay until 12, I think. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yes. that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, do you want me to let people in now, Catherine? Because it's three minutes to... Yeah, I think we should, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, we can just start admitting all now, can't we? Yeah. And I'll... Okay, so, so 11, everyone mute. 11 people incoming. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning everyone, I'm Catherine from WEN Wales and um, we're really pleased to have you joining us this morning. Um, just so you're not sat there in complete silence wondering what's going on, um, I'll tell you a bit about what we're going to do and I'll have to say this a few times, so if you join early, um, I'm afraid you're going to hear this a couple of times as people join. So welcome, first of all, please keep yourself on mute. Um, at this point until a bit later. Um, well, in fact, please all keep yourself on mute. Sorry, use the chat box to ask any questions or put any links of any information you'd like to share with others on the cafe. We're going to be starting, um, we'll wait until we've got a really good crowd. We've got about 70 people registered for this really important discussion. So we'll probably start about, you know, five past 11, I should think, by the time everyone's in. Also, it's up to you, please leave your camera on if you want your camera on, um, or turn it off if you don't want your camera um, on, that's totally up to you. So welcome everyone, I'm Catherine Fuchs, Director of WEM Wales. Um, we're really looking forward to this discussion, this really important discussion about the impact that this crisis is having on Bain people. We'll be starting in a few minutes when we've got um, everyone, everyone with us. A Couple of housekeeping things. Please do share any links you've got to your own policy documents, interesting articles, anything you want shared with the group, please share it on the chat function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, we ask you to keep yourselves on mute, please. Um, apart from the speakers, because that helps us manage things. Um, this is being recorded and you will have consented to that when you joined. Um, we'll get started soon. We're still waiting for more people to join us. Sarah, how are we doing? Um, with our last panelist. Uh, nothing as yet. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> not to worry. So welcome everyone, if you've just joined us, welcome. I'm Catherine from WEN Wales and 
Um, we're really delighted. We've got some amazing panelists lined up for you this morning who are going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on um, BAME women and the disproportionate impact. And we're going to focus as well on some of the solutions, what we think we can do about it. So welcome if you've just joined us. Hi. Always exciting seeing the sea of faces joining us. It's really great. This is our fourth WEM Cafe um, we've done. And everyone we seem to get more engagement, which is brilliant. For those who've just joined, we'll be starting shortly. And um, please keep yourself on mute. Feel free to post links and articles and useful, um, useful policy papers that you may have written or your organization may have written in the chat box. And please do ask questions via the chat box. Um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll start by introducing our brilliant speakers in a few minutes. Great. Welcome everyone. If you've just joined, I'm Catherine Fuchs. I'm the director of WEM Wales. We're really pleased to have so many people on this call to discuss this really important issue of the impact of COVID-19 on BAME women and the disproportionate impact. We're gonna get started very soon. Um, we're just waiting for more people to join us. And do introduce yourselves on the chat as well. Say who you are, because um, it's nice for people to know who's on the call. Use the chat function as you would in a normal meeting when you introduce yourselves to people and give business cards. If you want to share your details with people, please go for it. We're gonna start very soon. Um, it just got some more people in the waiting room. And so, you know, a bit of housekeeping again before we start. Um, we are um, recording this meeting and you will have been informed of that when you join the meeting. Um, and we'll be sharing this recording with the participants here. Um, just getting my screen sorted out. Great. How are we doing? I think we might um, get started now because lots of people here. Thank you all for coming. So, good morning and welcome. My name's Catherine Fuchs. I'm the director of the Women's Quality Network Wales and um, really delighted to welcome you all to this WEN Cafe, the fourth in our series of cafes um, and this one around the important issue of how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted BAME women. Um, please feel free to tweet. Um, feel free to tweet on um, the cafe. The hashtag is WhenCafe. Please, if you've just joined us, I'm sorry to repeat myself for those who've been with us for a while, place your questions and, our, um, and comments in the chat box. Also, um, any questions that you want to direct um, to the panel because Sarah Sweeney um, from WEM Wales will be, who's waving now, will be managing the, the questions we're going to ask our panelists as we go along. Um, so I've said about the hashtag, the meeting's being recorded um, and I think that's all it for the housekeeping, except please keep yourself on mute. Um, so WEM Wales, um, our vision is um, to create a Wales free from gender discrimination. And we've all seen the statistics around um, BAME women and BAME men, and the statistics around the appallingly high death rates 
Bay men are 4.2 times more likely to die from COVID-19, and Bay women are 4.3 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. So this is a really serious issue, and um, we wanted to try and ask our panelists, who we're going to introduce any minute, first of all, why they think this um, is happening, and secondly, more importantly, the solutions, because it's really important. Every cafe we've had, I've had one on poverty, one on health, one on violence against women. We then um, take the findings from this cafe, these cafes and pass them up to Welsh Government to encourage them to tell them the lived experience of women and also to encourage them to take action. So we want to really focus on solutions today. Um, so I want to first of all discuss, sorry, introduce our excellent panellists, all four of them. So we have, we're delighted to have Uzo Iwobi, who's the um, Specialist Policy Advisor to Welsh Government um, on equalities. And Uzo is also, I think I can describe her as a real leader in the BAME community in Wales. She's also set up um, the All Wales BAME group on um, WhatsApp, which is a really good forum for discussing um, what's going on um, for that community in Wales and if you want to be a part of it you're more than welcome to um, ask her to be a member of it and you can pop that in the chat. I'd also like to introduce my Muna Solomon who you can see um, on your screens and she is an activist and you may know her she's the founder of the brilliant Privilege Cafe which I know some of you have been coming along to which is such an important space to talk about privilege, how we use our privilege. Um, my Moon has also been working for the NHS previously and has a master's in public health. Fine. Thirdly, we've got Leila Usmani, um, who is uh, working for Race Alliance Wales now, and she's um, doing their policy and research. She's also an independent diversity and equality trainer. So welcome, Leila. Welcome, Uzo. Welcome, Maimuna. And um, do we have Shivana with us yet, Sarah? Oh, great. Excellent. So also, I'd really like to welcome Shivana Taj, who is um, the General Secretary for Wales TUC. She's doing an incredible job. I mean, she's been on nearly every Zoom call I've been on recently. Um, and she's doing an incredible job in terms of highlighting the concerns and needs of workers especially during this crisis. So welcome to our four panellists. I'm going to get underway now by asking uh, some questions. And as I said earlier, please do ask questions in the chat boxes um, yourself. So if you think of things as I'm asking questions and as people are talking, please do um, join in. So first of all, Uzo, I'm going to come to you. So I, I want to, I mean, we're all deeply worried about the way um, this crisis is, is impacting BAME women um, and, the, and especially the fact that they're way more likely to lose their lives. So I'd like you to start by sharing some reflections on why you think this is happening. Right. Um, just uh, as a little bit of a background, um, it was really helpful to look at uh, the articles uh, produced by B uh, the uh, business in the community um, and they they talk about the that women make over make up over fifty point eight percent of the resident population of England and Wales, and um, as at the last census, thirteen point nine percent of the three point nine million of these women were from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds. So, BAME um, backgrounds. So if you look at the data from the latest annual population survey that, that was uh, completed between January to December 2019, it shows that BAME women currently make up 16% of the female working age population of England and Wales, and white women make up the 84%. So it's worth noting that um, BAME men currently make up 15% of the male working population. So we, uh, it's well documented that um, people from the Windrush generation came to the UK in the 1948s and right up to 71, 80. 
and to work in the NHS largely and that uh, big women um, from some of the, these backgrounds are overrepresented in health and social care services um, in 2020. So the current um, um, uh, COVID-19 crisis has adversely impacted not just on these Windrush um, um, members, but also community groups who have migrated to, to work as healthcare workers and frontline workers, people from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, people from Nigeria, predominant numbers of people working in the NHS um, today come from some of these areas of the world. And um, the rise in the deaths within the Filipino health, commun health uh, uh, community is unbelievable. I mean, only last week, last week um, in Newport, two um, uh, uh, Filipino nurses died, husband and wife, and left children from the age of seven, um, going down with three children who are now uh, in care um, with people who may not understand their cultures, their heritage, and all, all that information. There is a, a, a real concern which was highlighted at the COVID-19 Orwell's BAME Forum that we um, that I organized last week on the 11th of May, um, the, the representative from the Filipino community um, alleged that um, there was a lot of discrimination being faced by nurses in the workplace um, and significant deaths within their community. The same thing is happening to Black Africans, African women, African men, African Caribbean women, um, I'm sure many of you would have seen the um, advert for, uh, you know, the passing of Donna Campbell, who uh, is who was based in Car in Cardiff and sadly um, died from COVID-19. And uh, she worked in Valindra uh, Health Trust, and um, she's left two children. One is just turned 18, and the younger boy is 12. And you know some of the issues that um, these cases have brought up is that women who form often the bedrock of the society and family, when they die, when they uh, pass away, the children are often impacted significantly, especially those who come from international other countries who may not naturally have the family structures of grandma, grandpa, uncles and aunties around. Many of these young kids now are being placed into care in homes that don't understand the culture and heritage, a complete loss of, of, of a sense of who you are, sense of identity, sense of belonging, understanding of the culture and what is happening for many of these young children. So women, it says that the stats show us that 6.1 of NHS workers are Black, uh, Black African, Black British, Black Asian, and make up only up to 3.4% of the population. But the biggest worries have been around the mental health for some of the women who have suffered and continue to suffer. Now, the context is really important. Um, a third of the COVID-19 patients are from BAME backgrounds, which is disproportionate when compared to um, their 13% representation in UK and Wales. Um, and something is interesting, uh, many of the people who, are, uh, who have come into the UK as migrants or into Wales as migrants have um, in, important commitments and, and um, important um, contributions to their home countries. So many of them are working not just to support people here, but also um, support um, families abroad. So they're taking on extra work, long hours, and uh, this isn't generic. This is just something that I know I'm aware of because I'm an, a Nigerian, originally a Nigerian woman. Myself, I've naturalized uh, in Wales. And the, the need to send back money to help, help others in the community who don't have is something that I think a lot of non- white um, people would understand because that is customary that when you go to get when you get a, a job you have that nurturing need to continue to support 
the wider community. For whatever reasons, it seems that some of the uh, women are in the front line being pushed. Um, there was a real concern raised by a speaker at the COVID-19 Orwell's uh, meeting on Monday. And she's a lady from Zimbabwe and said that she felt that black women were being pushed into the front line of the COVID-19 crisis uh, particularly. So this has obviously been picked up by Welsh government and health officials who um, attended that meeting. And I believe that they're doing um, a, a couple of checks and conversations in the background. I have to say that um, the Deputy Minister and Chief Will has, um, and the First Minister, they've been absolutely brilliant in terms of their, their engagement with grassroots groups across the whole of Wales. They've gone to um, the East, um, uh, all Wales East meetings to listen to what people are saying. They've come to the Race Council Cymru Hub meetings to hear the wider community and the uh, Deputy Minister and Chief Whip attended the BAME, All Wales BAME COVID meeting on Monday. And um, the, the um, establishment by the First Minister of the COVID-19 Advisory Comi Comi Committee, which is made up of um, senior professors of medicine, uh, professors of research and law, um, professors, uh, you know, consultants from BAME groups themselves is really been powerful because they brought a lot of knowledge as well as splitting off into the sub subcommittees. Um, one that is producing the first ever risk assessment toolkit that is going to transform lives for everybody. It's not just going to be a toolkit for um, black people or uh, Asian people is going to be a, a toolkit that will enable the NHS to test and assess um, the risk that every individual woman or man is in and to decide what to do. And this is part of the uh, response to the rise in deaths of BAME people. So is that uh, subcommittee is chaired by Professor Keshav Shinga, who is um, the chair of the Br BAPIO. So it means the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. And okay. he's the chair of that committee. And then you also have a subcommittee on socioeconomic duty to look at uh, socioeconomic impact, to look at the wider um, community Im impact for um, BAME people. And that's chaired by Professor Emmanuel Obodna, working with some of the health um, officials. I know Shavana has um, presented uh, to a number of these forums and uh, Rothio has as well and we've had people like Suzanne Duval there presenting on mental health and BAME issues. We've had people like Humi Webb who's a massive activist for black history and also chairs the uh, Welsh, one of the Welsh government um, um, disability forums and um, We've had um, Geno Legal, also from a Butte Town, a former councillor of Butte Town area with the Tiger Bay representation. Um, we've had a lot of women coming to input and give the insight of women. I think we have to be positive, Catherine, because this advisory committee is working every week. They're meeting every week and they're working at breakneck speed to make sure that, you know, we save lives, that these tools are ready to go out. So um, if you listen to the uh, Deputy Minister's speech yesterday, um, you can yeah. hear a bit more about it. I don't want to take too much time. And just okay. to say, yeah, think, hi, everyone. Okay, yeah, if you, um, Uzo, would you like to, I will come back to you. I think you've raised some really important points there. I'm sorry to cut across, but I really want to hear from all our panelists. Um, I, you've made some really important points such as, I think, the forums obviously really strong and it's good that they're having a lot of different representations from different BAME women but I think um, oh I'm a really impatient person for change and for solutions so I, I'm glad you're saying the risk assessment is happening and let's come back to that later I'd like to now ask Shivana from Wales TUC what we can do in the short term it's really building on the question we just asked Uza what can we do now in the short term to address the problems that are happening right now that Uzo um, referred to around frontline staff removing um, BAME women and 
vulnerable women, you know, obviously disabled women potentially, or um, women with diabetes and underlying health conditions may also have um, big issues around being in the front line. So I'd love to hear from you, Shivana, from the Wales TUC point of view, what can be done right now to support those women? Well, what we have to remember is that we, we are currently in a, in a place where we're not only just trying to support those workers who are already physically at work. Of course, there's a large population, large, you know, considerable number of people who are currently working from home, including teachers, of course. And many of you would have seen over the last couple of days the amount of, you know, um, uh, uh, negative press actually towards teachers because of the fact that they are trying to do the right thing and trying to make sure that schools are safe before both they physically return and children return and, and of course parents start um, picking up the, their children in those environments as well. Uh, the immediate things that have to happen and, and this has always been the case but particularly now that we are uh, facing a potential second peak of, of the virus. This virus is not going to go away, despite what many people may say otherwise. Um, but they are clearly going to be concerns and they are concerns about the economy and what that means for the ordinary person. But for many people, they haven't had a choice but to continue working one way or another because of the fact that several, um, I would say a large percentage of frontline workers and key workers are low paid. So they don't have a choice of removing themselves away from a situation. And therefore, what we should be doing is to make their workplaces safe. We need to be ensuring that we are conducting individual health risk assessments as well. And as you say, it's not just for, for being women, but it's for, for all workers in those um, who, are, who are vulnerable. And this is something that should have happened as part and parcel of uh, what people do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we should have been happening right from the get-go. This should never have been an add-on because this is already something that's covered under the health and safety legislation that exists. Talking about the health and safety legislation, again, um, if any worker is um, feeling vulnerable or feels unsafe, they have every right to refuse to work in that environment until their employer makes that space safe for them. Now, there's lots of conversations being ta taking place um, about maybe moving people away and redeploying them elsewhere and all of this type of thing. And again, these are things that you would do for any situation. It's, it's a reasonable adjustment. It, it's, you're not asking for special treatment. You're just asking for a reasonable adjustment. But there's been... The issue is, is that there's been lots of confusion, particularly over the last couple of days where you've had the Prime Minister come out with one particular statement, um, you know, the, the slogans, for example, lots of people, loads of confusion over, you know, in Wales, it's still stay home and stay safe. In England, it's watch out for the virus or whatever the latest one is. Um, and that's caused loads of confusion. And again, um, certain um, sectors have reopened those that were closed. Um, but then at the same time, they haven't actually been, um, we haven't hammered out the details in terms of what a safe workplace looks like and ensuring that there's guidance in place as well. So um, yesterday we had our first uh, main meeting with Welsh Government. And you know, from Wales to UC perspective, we have welcomed that the, the government here has taken a more cautious approach um, uh, to the lockdown. And, and actually looking at gradually reopening. Um, we've always made it very clear, and we did yesterday as well, that we need to have full consultation um, for all workers that are gonna be impacted. Um, for example, there's references being made now about libraries and recycling centers opening. And again, those workers are gonna need to feel safe. And of course, you then also need to take into account those workers who are shielding as well. And what is gonna happen for those workers who on a normal day would have gone to work, but if they're gonna be shielding, who is gonna be covering their responsibilities? Um, you know, again, um, many volunteers have um, uh, you know, been identified and we've made it very clear as well that when it comes to volunteers and when it comes to paid, paid work, we need to have very clear lines. Um, I'm genuinely very concerned about, again, um, some of the stuff that's been leaked in the press over the last couple of days about who's going to pay for all of this going forward. And again, everyone's, people are vulnerable, people are really scared. So 
And we know that the, on a global level, we are potentially heading towards a recession like we've never seen before. And um, people are worried, they're anxious about returning to work. So they need to know that their workplace is going to be safe. They need to know exactly what their rights are when they get there. They need to know exactly what a risk assessment looks like. Where can they actually get access to that risk assessment? And it's, you know, for, for me, it's always a case of keeping all workers protected. And of course, we, those that are unionized are more likely to be in a safer environment. There will be a process, there will be ways and means of them getting assistance. But what about those workers who, were, who don't have that option? And that is the reason why the, the Wales TUC, we launched the whistleblowing site. Through that, we have been able to help a, a number of workers. Um, again, there's loads of anxieties now about PPE. And we've, you know, we know that there's, there still are gaps within health and social care. Um, it is much better than it was previously. Social care in particular were kind of like last on the list. And part of that was because of the fact that, you know, social care, a large part of social care in Wales is actually privately owned. Um, and we are again talking to government about we need to be looking at bringing services back in house. And Welsh Government does support that position. But again, these things are, are going to cost money. And it is back down to the Barnet formula. And it is also in, for, for certain things to happen. We also need to have more devolved powers that we don't currently have. So we're kind of in this sort of strange space. Um, and again, capacity for testing. What is the strategy for testing? Um, we, we, we get, an, you know, announcements are made um, every single day and everyone's going, well, what does that mean to me? So I would say what would be really helpful, and, and we've again said this to government, is, is that we need a public campaign. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be ongoing. Daily announcements are one thing and emails and sharing information here, then everywhere is one thing, but people need to know and be able to understand where they fit in to all of this as well. That's um, great. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Shavana. Um, sorry to cut in. Um, what you're saying is incredibly important about the return to work and the risk assessments and people knowing their rights. And we'll pop some um, things on the chat. Uh, if we can find your whistleblowing site, uh, we'll definitely put the link up there um, for people um, to share as well. Now I'd like, I'd like to come to Maimuna now because um, Maimuna is an activist and um, founder of the Privilege Cafe. And I want her, I've asked, I'd, I'd love you to share with us how lockdown has impacted you individually, Maimuna. And I understand that you want to do this as a spoken word piece, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to pass over to you. Great. Thank you so much um, for inviting me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. Because my mic has been playing up a lot recently for some reason. Okay. So yeah, I, I found it easier just to put it down as a spoken um, word piece. I'll just go straight into it. It is a little bit longish, but I'll be as quick as I can. Okay. So. So being in lockdown has meant my eyes have been opened to a new world of injustice. It's shown me paths that I knew existed, but in a much brighter light. COVID was never a causal factor of racism, but it's an enabler of a system so deeply rooted in racism and division. It is those with less money that, is, that are impacted the most, but those with more pigment in their skin are impacted harder. They say people of color have color in their skin, enough to be diverse, but not enough to be treated as equal. Questions go through my head round and round in what I call the conveyor belt of injustice, conveyor wheel of injustice. This injustice may, may be invisible to some, less visible to others, but impacts many invisible ways. I think about, I think about those with less than me. Less than me in terms of food, electric, gas, heat, networks and money, but also less than me in terms of language, belonging and inclusion. I think of these people and then I think of those with power and privilege. I think of those putting fuel into the conveyor wheel of injustice, it's those people that push me to do more. Both in terms of helping the most vulnerable who are shielding, including those with language barriers, but also pushes me to stop that conveyor wheel of injustice from going round and round in circles. This lockdown has ignited within me the passion for change, changing the way those with power change their mindset and eagerness to continue to keep, and their eagerness to continue that conveyor wheel of injustice from going round. The feeling of being on that wheel spinning round and round and your voice being shut out by those with privilege hurts so bad. 
the privilege to come to, come to my cafe week after week are those I want to help. I open every week hoping and praying that they realize that they have power and privilege and to use it for good. I pray, those, I pray that those with seldom voices be heard and for them to be part of society and for them to be treated as equal, to be treated as human. They may not speak the language of the country they're in, nor, the, nor may not have money to buy food, but they are human and bleed the same blood as you and me. Let those of us that have privilege take a moral high ground and a duty of care to speak and act on the common language of care and compassion. Let us stop that conveyor, belt of, conveyor wheel of injustice at every opportunity we get and let's hold our hands together whilst doing it with a stronger, much more equal impact for all. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. That was brilliant, my Muna. So I think you, you captured um, a lot of what people are feeling, and I particularly like the, in, the um, imagery around the conveyor wheel of injustice. Mm. And really, that's what we all need to come together and try and solve, isn't it? We, we, and events like this and your privileged cafe and this horrendous shock that we are going through um it's almost it's it's feeling how we can use this moment to, to break that wheel that conveyor wheel of injustice and get people off it and it's really certainly from Wen's perspective what this crisis has done is it's it's shone a light on the inequality that already exists and it's also um you know the, the problem we've got is it threatens to erode any progress that has been made and push us back in terms of equality for BAME women in terms of equality for disabled women and all those unprotected characteristics so that's what we're worried about and um i just your... wanted to add maybe with regards to um, like there's so many people in communities like the community i live in in butte town and literally they just feel like they're shut away from the rest of the world you know there's there's this whole thing of there's support out there but who is it actually reaching that's the question. Is it actually, you know, I myself are supporting disabled women in Butte Town, for example, who can't speak the language. There's a lot of support out there, but is it actually being filtered out to communities or is that word community just being used? Because it, I do hear that a lot. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of power and privilege and that even filters within minority communities. So, you know, even that is, 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 is really unfair because I constantly been here, you know, we're supporting communities, we're supporting communities, but which communities and who? Is it just within that circle that you're working within? Because really and truly you can't say communities then. It's, it's a lot more work needs to be done. And then a lot of women are shielding, for example. They can't work. So they're in the house. So where, where are the job opportunities for them? Even, and, you know, people are asking for our support and help. You know, are we being paid? Where are the jobs, where are the remote jobs working from home? At the same time, people are asking for our support and help but we're not being valued for it. There's a lot of jobs that can actually be created on the back of hearing, you know, this organization has this amount of money, this organization has this amount of money. It needs to be much more filtered out to actual, you know, much more at a grassroots level because we're in these spaces, but we're being spoken for and not actually being represented, whatever that means. But yeah, I think it's really, really important, the work that, you know, at least when the, the space that you're creating here is really important it's an ama and it's amazing, but we need actual action because a lot of it, we've known for a long time that BAME people have been impacted. We've known that for years and years. COVID has just, I guess, shone this huge light on it. We knew this for a long, long time. And, you know, BAME people have been impacted in the hospitals, but it just took a long time. I guess for that message to come out, we knew this information. It's not any. It's, there's no new information that people from BAME communities have actually heard. This is this is not new information. We've, we've just been impacted much, much harder. But I mean, in terms of the advice, I think people in communities are doing a lot of work behind closed doors. A lot of women are doing a lot of work, and we need support in terms of funding and being, you know, because there's a, there's jobs that can be created really easily. Admin jobs. There's, you know, consultancy jobs. We're already doing it, but we're just doing it for free, which is really unfair. So I think it needs to come from government much more, um, you know, those at the top with the power and the money we need to really and truly filter down, you know, this whole thing of I'm busy, I'm busy. We know you're busy, but at the same time, people are dying. So the, the two don't go together, really don't go together at all, in my view. No. So, 
Yeah. Absolutely. We need we need action. And um, I've been on some of these forum phone calls, um, as have you and, and others on, on this group. And I, I think that's what we need to do as a third sector. And one of the things that umbrella groups like WEN in, in the women's sector and Tai Pao in the housing sector, we need to try and galvanize and make sure that, you know, that people act together and we demand action and we demand action strongly. Um, I do think that uh, we we are I, I, we are in, in a slightly positive place because of our government in Wales. I, I I know that may be an unpopular thing to say, but I've just been on a call with UK wide women's organisations who are dealing with the fact that um, they've got a government that's already um, you know said lockdown is um, over and expecting people to go back to work straight away without any kind of risk assessments and so on. And I know um, that that the TUC, the national TUC, the UK TUC were on that call too, and they're working on that. So yeah, there, there are positive things happening in Wales and these forums, but we, I think the message needs to go back to government. Um, and I know Uzo will take it back to government, which is we need action and we need it now. And we all need to work better To I think the other thing that's come out of the crisis, um, my Muna, is this thing, you know, we're just advertising a job at WEN Wales. Um, for an engagement communications officer and before we would have said location Cardiff almost without thinking and now we can say location the whole of Wales it, it's it's absolutely right that that person can work from anywhere so we need to hold on to those positives now, I'm conscious we should come to our fourth panelist Layla um, to ask her and I'd like to ask Layla how we can address some of the structural inequalities in the longer term that have led to this situation. So we've already heard from our three panelists about some of those problems, but what can Race Alliance do to help and what can really we all do to help uh, try and resolve some of these structural inequalities? Thanks, Catherine. Um, and thanks, Uzo and Shav and Maimuna for what you've had to say. It's been really interesting. And um, I don't know if I can follow Maimuna's spoken word because <laughs> um, that was really touching. Um, I mean, there's a huge question and we have heard about these structural inequalities. It's, it's a massive question. I don't know if I can answer it or I can try and address some of the things that we could do. We need to understand essentially why do these structural inequalities exist? And I know that Maimuna alluded to a lot of this in her spoken word piece. Um, we live in a society that's underpinned by systemic racism. This was developed hundreds of years ago because of the colonial capitalist expansion project. And this has led to institutional racism being rife in the institutions that manage and run our society. Um, what we're seeing is this is interacting with patriarchal systems of power um, and has led to these structural inequalities. And in Wales, what we see is that, you know, there's not a good enough representation representation of BAME women in these institutions. You see institutional racism, systems of patriarchy playing out when the power is invested in white people, when the power is invested in white men. Um, so we need to increase that representation in the long term. One thing, it's really great to hear from Uzo about the work that is being done. Um, there's lots of forums, lots of advisors, lots of committees. Are we actually holding those positions of power directly? Um, I would argue that not yet, not enough. What can we do? There's lots of research and evidence and um, at Race Alliance Wales, we're undertaking some research at the moment on the theme of representation. And we can see that things like positive action, um, including mentoring programs, blind shortlisting, having diverse panels, and importantly, valuing lived experience um, as equal to professional experience is really important. But I think we've also got to consider that when people get into these institutions, there's a culture of racism because this, this systemic racism is fed by people's beliefs, ideas and knowledge around um, the, the state of play. And I think two big institutions that need to be addressed are the media and education, because until we can start changing the messaging that's coming out, that's not going to be impacting these systems of power that are in place and that are dictating the behavior of our institutions. Um, so I think, you know, what, what we're doing at RAW is we're undertaking this research. We are an alliance. Our research is co-owned by our members and all of our contributors and our supporters. Um, and as individuals, you know, we need to start reflecting on our role, um, on our role in upholding these institutions 
um, we need to start thinking about, and again, Maimuna alluded to this and spoke about this, we need to think about when, when do we need to step up um, and when do we need to step aside? When do we need to be an ally? But we can't be complacent. We need to do one or the other. Um, and we also need to start working to change our cognitive bias. And this is through those institutions and other institutions. Um, and in the meantime, push for the measures and checks in place so that policy and practice and stuff that's trickling down onto the ground can start to be inclusive and address the, those, those inequalities that are there. And hopefully one day we'll end up in the utopian situation of um, not having this in place. That's great, Leila. Thank you very much. I think it's very good that you're so clear and we need to say it like it is. There is structural and institutional racism. In yeah, absolutely. And, and we I need think, to deal with that. Yeah, and um, I hope that Sarah will share a, a really good article. I mean, I'm not a, a medical professional, but this is also highlighting the institutional racism that's prevalent in the NHS. And yes, we celebrate our NHS. Yes, it is amazing. <clears throat> but it's not perfect and there are some key examples you know we've got the nightingale hospitals springing up and lo and behold an all-white management team when there are plenty of medical professionals that could have been appointed who are from black asian and minority ethnic communities um, as well as other examples so i could go down that line yeah and i i yeah we've heard um stories from some of our members who are nurses on the front line who who say there is certainly racism around who is given the PPE and who is pushed to the front line and how if you're an agency worker, you're less likely to um, be, well, you're more likely to be pushed to the front line and potentially not have the 100% excellent equipment. Now, I want, I really thank you for all your contributions. I've now got some questions from the floor that I'd just like to raise, a couple here. Um, and do please put things in the chat um, if you'd like to ask a question. So, um, in fact, this one relates very well to, to what um, I've just been talking about. So I'd like to ask Shivana, I think, why are BAME men and women the first to be asked or pressured to work overtime on their days off or longer hours during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, this is a massive risk for both themselves and their families. So if you could answer that one, please, Shivana. Um, well, there's two sides to this, and that is that um, a large proportion of uh, BAME workers um, in Wales are, who are on the front line are migrant workers. Um, some of them actually have no choice um, but to take on extra shifts. Um, they, have, um, they have no recourse to public funds. And um, therefore, they all, and, and every two and a half years, they've got to do a, a visa renewal. Uh, the visa renewal costs three and a half grand plus legal fees um, and then um, of course you know you've got cost of living that hasn't gone down let's be honest and austerity has, has hit hard um, very much so uh, low paid workers and, and bane workers in particular so i think that it is it is it's, it's a it's a double-edged um, position however the tuc in early 2020 nationally we did some research we did some polling um, and it was just before COVID happened, actually, um, that the data came out. And the data revealed that 56% of BME women and 48% of BME men reported being allocated harder or less popular tasks than their white counterparts. Um, our report is Racism Real revealed that despite experiencing high levels of discrimination, BME staff do not feel confident in reporting this and almost half were not reporting any incidents at all. Um, so for me, COVID-19 is uh, no different to any, any normal day of work for, for many of these workers. And I think that um, they, again, what's been uh, shared uh, with us from individuals um, and I mean, one thing I want to say is that I've really taken heart from the fact that more BAME workers are feeling confident in speaking out. Um, and that's something that's been good in terms of some of these types of forums where people have had the opportunity to speak in safe spaces and that they have seen uh, more people coming out in the media. And, um, and again, it is about when you are in a position, and I am in a position of privilege and power um, as a woman of colour, it is important that I 
don't just sit down and not challenge what's going on around me, but I, but I do something while I'm there. And it is important that we highlight these issues and we have those difficult conversations. And until we actually push for those changes to happen, nothing is going to change. So again, it, it, this is systemic, it's structural, and um, until we actually tackle those issues head on, these things are going to carry on happening, COVID or not. Thank you, Shivana. Um, I've got some other questions here. Um, there, it, an interesting comment, I think I've got, I'll come to you who's over this one. There's also pushback needed on public bodies who for the longest time have propped up gatekeepers within BAME communities. Just, I need, Uzo, you need to unmute. Sorry, I was talking without unmuting. Sorry, um, this is something really powerful and very important. And increasingly, um, we are looking at how to um, support um, grassroots BIM groups. And I think um, my Muna is correct. We have been, unfortunately, the funding, um, funding of, of charities in Wales has been led largely by those who, who are good at writing bids rather than those who are, are really good at delivering and those who have funding to get bid writers. Whereas a lot of our grassroots BAME groups who are really tackling day-to-day -day issues. I know a lady in um, North Wales, Yolanda Ban Vigas, who's providing support to 2,000 Portuguese families, worked as a volunteer, and she has a disabled daughter for 15 years with no income because she just didn't know how to um, complete bids. So this is a real issue that, you know, even Welsh government have, have been hearing the voices of grassroots through this engagement pro project, a process that's happened. Like Maimuna said, um, these are, um, you know, um, is, these are problems that have been structural and intrinsic to the very nature of our society. But it seems that COVID has driven everything to the top. And now that we're looking at it, let's look at it properly and see how we can actually capacity build for uh, grassroots groups who are actually doing this work to be resourced and be funded. Why shouldn't it be um, looked at again? So there's a right. lot of work to do with uh -huh. people like, um, you know, the National Lottery, and some of these, the lottery, the Good Causes Lottery Foundation, in terms of being used to giving money only to the people who they've given for the past 15 years. You know, we need every hand on deck. Those who are activists need to be resourced to be able to continue going. You can only be an activist as long as you can afford to be an activist. If you're resourced, you're energized and empowered to make that change that you so want to make. So I think there has to be a conversation which I can take back definitely to Welsh Government and, and share the thoughts of people from this forum about how we look at this thing and how we support and encourage people to fund in um, uh, a different way to look at grassroots uh, voices. You know, another activist I know who works a lot as a volunteer is Ali Abdi. I'm sure many of you know him. In the uh, and just works to lift the voices of uh, the young people through the National BAME Youth Forum. And Angel is our Jim, who is uh, the uh, female uh, elected member of the uh, Welsh Parliament for Race Council Cymru. She's just incredible. She's four, 14 or 15, but she's such a dynamite. And to empower their voices to be heard. I think okay. it's, it's great that we're having this conversation. Thank you, Catherine. Great, and th thank you, Uzo. And I, I know my Muna, who is an activist herself, um, would like to come in on this. Just wanted to say, like, it'd be interesting to know how many people in the room um, work for an organisation where they're not using their training budget. They could actually use that now because we're in lockdown to actually pay people and create jobs for people. But, you know, an example is a helpline in Butown alone is twenty percent BME. I don't know what helplines are available out there, but we could actually definitely use with one because there's a high proportion of Somalis living here who don't speak the language. That alone would be, enable me to help 
some of the women who, you know, I might not be able to reach. Why can't we create a helpline for people who speak Somali or other languages? I don't know what helplines are out there, but that could be an easy job. So I just, I'd be interested in how many people in this room have money in their training budget that they're not using in the organization, just to go back and see how many, whether they could actually use that budget for good to create jobs for people, temporary jobs or whatever it may be, to tackle something as simple as that helpline or advice roles, like frontline stuff where we can actually do from our home and stuff. So yeah, I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I know that, and, and Siobhan has just posted that um, there's some talk about creating a helpline that will be run by BAME women. Um, and that's something that certainly WEN would support. We had um, a project actually that was um, funded by the ROSA Fund to mentor women's groups and support and try. One of the things we did was we sat with those um, women's groups um, I've forgotten all the names of them. Sarah Sweeney will hopefully post in the chat because my brain is full of too many things. But we helped um, some of them with, we sat down, we allocated some of the money to help them put in funding bids um, and get their strategy sorted so they could do funding bids. But it was on a tiny scale. We only had enough to support 10 groups, but there were some refugee and asylum seeker groups. And that kind of thing but we, yeah I agree it's, it's the kind of thing we all need to do more of um, supporting funding applications um, there are some other comments coming in um, about mainstream women's organizations we need to ask questions of ourselves about our white privilege and how we use it absolutely I couldn't agree more that's from Maria Mesa um, thank you Maria um, questions about Welsh public money potentially being wasted hold the funded organizations to account, ask the difficult questions. If they're getting money to support main communities, let's make sure that it's going there. So yeah, there's a lot that we can all be doing in terms of um, um, making sure the money gets to where it's supposed to go. There's a question here I've just spotted come in and I'm gonna read out. There's, um, it's important we listen and learn from marginalized perspectives and act collectively to address these profound inequalities we need intersection approaches to ensure we understand and respond to the ways different factors such as ethnicity and disability combine. So yeah, a question there really around intersectionality and how we tackle the whole picture. Um, I'd like to um, ask another question now um, around, um, to Shabana, please, um, around um, the fact about, around economic resilience and um, obviously many of those people that we're talking about are very vulnerable in terms of um, poverty. Wales is the poorest country in the UK. So what do you think are the solutions, Shivana, in terms of other things like micro credit, interest free loans, training that can help um, move out of, us out of this, what is gonna be a hugely deep recession? <sighs> Um, there, there are several things, of course, we've now got um, the Bank of Wales, um, so, so that's a good starting point at least. I think that we need um, a massive economic um, stimulus, we, we need to kickstart a green recovery, um, we need to be creating jobs and, and protecting jobs as well, and that the sooner you know, we get investment to make this happen, the better. Um, Welsh governments recently um, made some commitments to increase increase their spending on areas such as sustainable travel, decarbonisation of the Welsh housing stock and new capital funding as well. Um, but actually, um, we, need, um, we need things to be moving a bit quicker and we need to factor all of this in um, as part of our recovery programme as well. Um, in order for us to be able to deliver this though, we, we need to be looking at a, a progressive taxation system um, for across the UK, actually. Um, uh, it's good. Over the last couple of days, uh, we heard um, Ken Skates, the minister, refer to the fact that um, any business that's currently received funding from Welsh Government that has um, a, a registered um, um, account in a tax haven, um, they're, gonna be, um, they're not going to be supported by the government going forward. But we do need to have a progressive taxation system in, in this country and, and Wales needs to be benefiting accordingly. Um, again, we've, we've heard about 
all of these, you know, various different projects as far as like the tidal lagoon and so forth. But what we've never really got down to is the detail of that. And what is that going to look like um, for women in particular, actually, that conversation is, is yet to be had. Um, again, there's um, other ways and means, um, as Mamuna has, has referenced, where there are a number of workers who have currently been furloughed. Um, there are opportunities for, for people to have some training um, while, um, while they, while they, you know, whilst they're physically um, not in work as well. Um, there are programs that, that can support that. There's personal accounts and various other things um, that the Welsh Government is already involved in. But we do need to um, we do need to establish a redeployment scheme, I would say, until um, they've now been extended until um, October. But we do need to um, establish a social partnership model um, that takes into account how we can job match people and how we can redeploy people going forward. Because I'm really concerned about, as I keep referring to, is um, uh, the, the recession around the corner. Um, we also need an early warning system for that as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, these are much bigger conversations that need to take place. Um, and potentially, we also then need to be looking at um, further devolutionary powers for, for government. And it's going to be um, interesting now because, you know, you've got, for example, in Manchester, you've got mayors, in Liverpool, you've got mayors. And the conversation about devolution is taking place in lots of different spaces. And um, it would be, I think, beneficial uh, for organisations like WEN to, to talk to their counterparts in those spaces particularly to see what it is that they are looking to do, how we can uh, work with them in collaboration um, and, 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 and look at some of the projects that potentially are going to be here as well. But where do women feature? Where do BAME people feature? Where do, where do young people feature in all of that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Shivana. One area that we haven't touched upon actually um, before I come to all four panellists to do a final kind of summing up, I'm going to ask you your, my final question in a minute, which is going to be, just to give you a bit of time to, to think it over, which is if you were First Minister, how you would, and you could do one thing that you felt could really impact positively on BAME women, what would it be? So I'm going to come around to you uh, shortly on that. But I wanted to raise something that I think is huge, um, which is around representation of BAME women in the Senate. Um, I know it's been brought up on the chat about the lack of BAME women um, in um, kind of public bodies in Wales, but I'm, I'm really ashamed to live in a country where in 20 years of de devolution, there has never been a BAME assembly member or member of the Senate as they are now. And that is shocking. Uzo is the only specialist policy advisor who is BAME in the whole of Welsh government. We don't have a woman elected and if i feel very strongly that you can't be what you can't see and we must take action to have i feel like this crisis maybe would have had a slightly well the the we, we've all got to work so hard now to get in our foots in the door to make sure that for example the the kind of council general's um roadmap going forward includes bame uh people's voices and women's voices and if we had some BAME members of the Senate, I think that would make a really big difference, some BAME women members of the Senate. So um, when you're doing your final summing up, um, it'd be great if you could potentially address that. Anyway, I'm gonna to come to Leila first. So your first minister, what are you gonna do? Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is learn to unmute my mic quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, a, that's also a big question. Um, there's so many things that I could think of. Um, you've just spoken about representation and I think I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna say two things. So I'm gonna follow on that line with the first thing and I'm gonna say that I would implement quotas for being female representation. And with that, I think we need to recognize that the BAME population is not homogenous. We can't just have one BAME woman representing the whole BAME population, for example. So therefore, sorry if this is um, difficult for some people to swallow, you might actually have to go beyond representation and not just fit in with the kind of BAME population percentage of the population figures and look at increasing that um, across the board. So I would introduce quotas. And the second thing that I would do would be to ensure that there is an independent inquiry 
um, regarding this in the NHS, in Public Health Wales, that there would be a Welsh inquiry taking place and it would be independent. I think it's shocking that that's not happening. Um, and I think it's shocking that the inquiry that is taking place is not independent because it reeks of, you know, when the police have internal inquiries and they're just going to be absolving themselves um, of, of their responsibility for this and they're going to be covering up and that's already showing through the messages that they're perpetuating about the reasons why this is happening and this whole kind of going down the eugenics line of um, illnesses. So those are my two things. Okay, so quotas and an independent inquiry, that's great. I'm coming to my Muna next. Um, what would I do if I was First Minister? Yeah, is the question. That'd be an amazing job. That'd be my, oh, that'd be a really, oh, you're muted, Catherine, sorry. Yeah, so um, I would, first of all, I'd probably arrange a Butown Bain takeover at the Senate for at least maybe either between one or a few days or even a week, so a Bain Butan takeover, and then that would create the um, Bain People's Parliament. That's what I would do. Great. Um, and now I'm going to come to Shivana. Um, one thing I wouldn't do is commission a report because I think there's been loads of them already. Um, I think I, I probably know what I wouldn't do rather than what I would do, but I think that the ideas that have already been presented are spot on. Um, I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't wait for a, uh, any kind of specialist to tell me what to do, because quite honestly, the answers are there already. So I would simply just act. And the other thing that I would do is I would make space. That's it. I'm having a problem with my unmute button. Thank you, Giovanna. Really good. Make space um, and act now. Very strong. Now, Uza, what would you do if you were First Minister to resolve the issue of the big impact that COVID 19's had on BAME women? Um, I think I would continue with every good thing that I'm doing. And I think everybody around this forum would agree that. Our First Minister has been absolutely brilliant at informing us daily briefings. He has been accountable, taken responsibility, even when we haven't got things right. And I do think, don't let this sound like a defence, because if you look at Boris Johnson, you will probably thank goodness that you live in Wales. And I tell you something, we've been brilliant at putting our hands up when things haven't particularly gone well. And I love the sense of accountability, the sense of political decency that we're experiencing in Wales. It's not easy to um, own up to when things haven't gone well as well as, but I truly admire uh, our first minister, but this is not about defending him. If I were in position, I would want to continue what he's doing. I would want to hear the voices of all the peoples of Wales. I would want to consider the way that we can implement by prioritizing those who are uh, most vulnerable, most needy, most disaffected, most disadvantaged. And I think that is, that is the manifesto that he's delivering. He's raised more than any other first minister of Wales. He's raised the profile of marginalized groups and given us a voice. And the interesting thing also is the fact that it is ethnic minority, physicians, doctors, consultants, uh, community activists that are briefing him on what matters to them and what the solutions are. And I think that's the first time in Wales. Often we have people coming in with their ideas from England and all other places and white people telling black people what's the matter with them and how to fix it. So I quite like the fresh approach of don't do it without us. It was a disability mantra. Don't try to fix us without us. I can't quite get it. Rian will correct me later, I'm sure. But that is um, a mantra of unity because we cannot live without each other. We need all the voices, all the views, all the expertise of absolutely everybody around the table. And that is what I would stri um, strive for if I were First Minister, to ensure that nobody is left out of this conversation. And Probably I would look at how to fund grassroots groups. I'm so passionate about money getting to grassroots and individual activists to actually effect change. 
if those people were resourced, people who are actually on the grassroots, you know, um, people like Maimuna, people who speak for the voices of the voiceless, their work will be much more impactive than many of us who sit around policies, uh, shuffling paper around. But I think those policies breathe, breathe life into activism because you can't act in a vacuum. So we need each other to thrive and 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 be and be absolutely um, impactive. So yes, I don't want to be first minister, but I do want to support the person who is. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Uzo, and um, thank you all our panelists. You've all brought a really different and interesting perspective um, for us all, and I can see a lot of smiles. Uh, around the, the cameras uh, of all our participants. So thank you very much for the audience for coming to listen to us and to participate. Thank you to our brilliant panelists. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day because you are all incredibly busy, um, really on the front lines of this. Um, I wanted to just give a final plug for When Wales uh, to say, please do join us if you're not a member because then you get first bits of information around um, who we are and what we do and what events we've got coming up and our reports and so on. And um, we'll pop in the chat uh, how you can join us. It's an online link and um, it's free to join. And I just think it's really important. One thing that's definitely come out of this conversation is um, the fact that we all need to work together, support each other, listen to each other and um, galvanize behind some, some key asks. And I think that's really important that we, that we continue these conversations. We've got another When Cafe next Friday. It's around the impact of COVID-19 on disability, um, on disabled women. And Rian um, Davis from Disability Wales is one of the panel. Um, she's waving, which is great. And um, so please do come along to that cafe. Do support My Mooners Privilege Cafe, which I've been to myself and which is so important and helpful um, please do tweet if you've enjoyed this event um, and you've got something out of it um, tweet about it with the hashtag when cafe and put your solutions into the mix um, I'm sure we will can share the contact details of all our panelists if anybody wants to carry on the conversation afterwards so a really big thank you to you all at 1207 I'm sorry we're seven minutes over but I felt it was really worth it um, have a good day and thank you very much everyone for your participation thank you everyone thanks a lot bye thank you bye everyone <laughs> Shall I pause recording? Yeah. Should we stop recording and say, well done? Yeah. Shall I stop it now and then it can start formatting? Yeah. I've put it on the cloud, is that right? I think so, yeah. Then we okay. can.